Ladies and gentlemen, can I begin this evening by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. My name is Michael Wesley. I'm the Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific here at ANU. And uh, it really does warm the cockles of my heart on this very cold night to see uh, a lecture theatre completely packed uh, to the gills uh, for a discussion about the South Pacific. Uh, it also uh, gives me great pride to welcome all of you to really the world's superpower of academic expertise on the South Pacific. When the Australian National University was founded in 1946, uh, part of the Commonwealth legislation that created this university mandated that one of the four founding research schools at the Australian National University was to be a research school of Pacific studies. That gives us a tradition and a history of working on the Pacific uh, of well over 70 years and something we're extremely proud of. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's wonderful uh, once again to be partnering with uh, Australian Foreign Affairs, a really terrific and welcome addition to uh, the intellectual landscape of this country to once again launch the next edition of Australian Foreign Affairs our sphere of influence. Uh, another great partner of uh, the College of Asia and the Pacific, and particularly our uh, Pacific Studies uh, program, is the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. In fact, we have been partnering with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, for almost as long as we've been studying the Pacific. And I, I think I can say we couldn't do what we do on the Pacific and in the Pacific without uh, the support uh, and the partnership and the counsel of our colleagues at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And so it's uh, a great pleasure of mine to introduce uh, James Gilling this evening. Uh, James is the first Assistant Secretary for the Pacific Bilateral Division in the Office of the Pacific in our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. James joined AusAid in 2001 as an economic advisor. He has been posted to Fiji and Indonesia, where he was head of the aid program from 2013 to 2015. Before joining AusAid, James worked as an economist with Oxford Policy Management, managed Difford's Natural Resources Office in Nigeria, and was a researcher with the UK's Natural Resources Institute. He was an ODI Fellow between 1987 and 1989, working with the Department of Agriculture and Livestock in Port Moresby. James managed the development policy and Pacific divisions under AusAid and managed the contracting and aid, aid management division from 2015 to 2018 in DFAT. He is now, as I said, the new Pacific bilateral division in the office of the, of the Pacific. Can you please join me in, in welcoming James Gilling to the lectern to kick off tonight's proceedings? Uh, well, good evening. I'd uh, also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal people, and by paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, interesting picture um, we've got here for illustrating Step Up. Um, Michael just talked through some of my background and it wasn't until I joined the um, Office of the Pacific that I actually went in one of these things. And I've been in different, different sizes of them. And it... What it uh, captures is the fact that um, there's an awful lot of uh, activity going on. There's an awful lot of, um, of stepping up taking place in the, in the Pacific. And what I'm here to do is just to talk you through a little bit of what that, what that looks like and what the government is actually, is actually doing. It's great to, to see such a packed audience. And I'm noticing a few friends in the audience, including some friends from the diplomatic community. And there's one member of the diplomatic community who I know won't be here, and that's um, John Carley, who is the uh, High Commissioner to Papua New Guinea, for Papua New Guinea. And the reason he's not here is because, as you probably know, um, his Prime Minister, um, James Marape, is currently a guest of government here in um, Australia. 
they're on a plane, uh, not one of those I hope, to Karata um, in Western Australia where they're going to be looking at some um, LNG um, uh, production facilities. And they're here for a whole week. And the reason that's relevant is because this is the first guest of government um, visit under the new uh, newly elected Australian government. And it's the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. As we know, the first, um, the first trip that the uh, new Prime Minister made, Prime Minister Morrison made, was to the Solomon Islands. So what I'm, what I'm describing here is um, a sense of the momentum and a sense of the scale of this step up that we're starting to see and what it looks like. Um, somebody else who isn't here, and in fact I think was originally slated to give this presentation, is Ewan MacDonald, who's head of the Office of the Pacific. And the reason Ewan's not here is because I've just been talking to him in Nandi, where he will be accompanying the foreign minister, who is having meetings uh, with the Pacific Forum in Suva, talking, among other things, about the Pacific Resilience um, Fund. So I'm describing here a sense of, of a, a great deal of, of presence, a great deal of engagement, a great deal of physical contact um, across the region. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, about why a step up. Um, one of the things that, um, that we share here across the region not, is not just our, our geography and our history, but also the values of liberal democracy, um, the rule of law, political, economic and religious freedom, equality, mutual respect, and of course, sport. So, the nature of our, of our links, the nature of our contacts across the region are, are profound and, and wide-ranging. And I wanted to quote what some, some of our, our, our leaders, what in particular my boss, the Minister, of, Minister for Foreign Affairs, has been saying recently. Yesterday she gave a speech at our Innovation Exchange talking about innovation in the Pacific. And I, I, I scribbled down what, she'd, what she said. Australia has long been the Pacific's largest development partner security partner and friend in time of need. This is a solid foundation, but our conversations in the Pacific over the last several years have made it clear that we can and should all do more together to rise to the challenge and opportunities of our new blue Pacific continent. She talks about the fact that we're committed to tackling the multifaceted challenges. So this is just yesterday within DFAT. We've got our minister talking about the way that we're engaging, the issues that we're taking on board as we step up in this way. Um, we are, you often hear um, interpretations of step up as being purely around the strategic issues that I'm sure um, Hugh will talk about in a minute. But again, to quote the foreign minister, um, as she was talking to Fran Kelly on Radio National a couple of months ago, I think just before possibly her visit to her, her first visit to Fiji um, under the new government. She said, if you look across the comprehensive program which we have established as part of Step Up, you'll see it goes to people-to-people -people links. It goes to education. It goes to infrastructure development. It goes to church-to-church -church relationships. And it goes to Pacific labor mobility. So in other words, she's talking about a set of engagements which go very, very broadly indeed. So... Um, in response and in recognition of the challenges across the region, and, the, and specifically the issues identified by Pacific leaders themselves, what we're seeing now is a record $1.4 billion in development spending that will take place this financial year. We're also working to coordinate the way that the Australian government works together. In this office of the Pacific, it sits within DFAT, but it could just as easily sit within a number of other organisations within the Australian government. It includes people from Treasury, from the police, from the Defence Force, from the Attorney General's office. It's a broad-based grouping of public servants who are trying to bring together those, those multiple areas of responsibility under one coordinated capacity. So... One of the key drivers of the way that we're looking at this step up is through the Boy Declaration that was agreed at last year's Pacific Forum. Um, during that forum, members identified climate change as a key security challenge, and that was embodied within that declaration. 
Our Prime Minister has made it clear that we'll work more closely than ever with the Pacific on issues of greatest concern, including climate solutions and disaster resilience. And to that end, we will keep the international commitments we've made and we'll continue to work towards more ambitious and effective global agreements, as that's the most effective way to tackle climate change at its source. We'll spend $300 million in the Pacific over four years on climate change and disaster resilience. We'll make available $1.5 billion in loans through the Australia in Infrastructure Financing Facility, which has just been um, opened at the start of this month, in fact. And that has an explicit objective of boosting climate resilience. And as I said earlier, we're also backing the Pacific Resilience Partnership. Um, and that, as I said, Ewan and the Minister will be talking about that um, over the next couple of days. So as the region's major development partner, we provide getting on for half of total development funds um, in the region that have been spent since 2011. But even that's not enough. So we are there not just representing Australia, but as, as, as a representing a group of nations who are willing to come together to pool resources to work with the Pacific. So with like-minded nations, we are coming together to address issues like the infrastructure deficits that we're seeing across the region. The Asian Development Bank, as you know, has identified this as being a deficit of around 60, million Australia, 60 billion Australia, um, Australian dollars. Clearly, this is not a gap that the Australian government alone can build. So we welcome um, a, a wide range of development partners coming on board. So, um, in summary, as we underscore the commitments of all Pacific Island Forum members to a shared responsibility for securing our, our, our Blue Pacific, we can see that the Australian government's step up is a real attempt to get to grips with some of these challenges as a, as a member, as a part of this region, and to try and make a, a measurable difference to the lives of the people that live within this region. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, James. Um, uh, my name's Jonathan Perlman. I'm the editor of Australian Foreign Affairs. Um, I will shortly be introducing our panel for tonight. Um, but before I do, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what's in our, in our latest issue. Um, and I'd also just like to thank James very much for that, for that presentation. Um, and James will also be um, responding to the panel later tonight. So we will hear his and I suppose um, um, the Def Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's viewpoint on some of the analysis that we'll hear from our panellists tonight. Um, well, it's, it's great to be here launching this issue and, uh, and I echo Michael's view that it's great, great to see um, this sort of interest in the Pacific, which I think also reflects um, some of the government's recent interest in the Pacific. This issue, um, our sphere of influence, rivalry in the Pacific, looks at Australia's relations with its Pacific neighbours and particularly its struggle um, to retain influence in its immediate region. And there are two um, trends or themes that really emerge from, from, um, from the pieces in this, in this issue of Australian foreign affairs um, as being challenges to Australia's position in the Pacific and they are um, China, um, and China's growing influence in the Pacific, it's growing links, it's growing trade, it's growing aid and investment, um, and also climate change, uh, which is proving to be a real stumbling block to Australia's relationship with, with countries in the Pacific. The level of anxiety about China's influence, I think, can be seen from the step up, which is um, really the... Um, coalitions and particularly Scott Morrison's signature foreign policy. Um, we just heard from James a little bit about that the depth of contact and presence that Australia now um, has in the Pacific. It's really quite incredible. There are announcements almost on a daily basis about what Australia is doing in the Pacific. Um, you know, they range from a, a $2 billion finance facility to uh, the naval base that Australia is setting up with the US in, in Papua New Guinea to uh, patrol boats being, being given out to, uh, to Pacific countries. 
to setting up diplomatic presences in countries as small as, as New A, which is one of the smallest countries in the world. It's um, to Scott Morrison making visits to Fiji and Vanuatu just before an Australian election, which is really quite amazing. And it was um, uh, it was the first ever state visit or bilateral visit by an Australian leader to Fiji um, and I think to Vanuatu. Um, so we are seeing these great changes unfold very quickly. And this issue of Australian foreign affairs tries to look at this phenomenon and at whether Australia is going to be able to secure its interests in the Pacific. So we have a piece by Hugh White, who we'll be hearing from shortly. Um, he looks at why Australia has developed this belief that it has to keep intruders out of the Pacific. And he's, he looks at how with China's rise, um, it is going to become impossible for Australia to retain an exclusive sphere of influence in the Pacific. And that is a profound shift for Australia's, not only Australia's defence, but really I think the way Australia thinks about itself. About itself. Um, and, uh, and he looks at, at some of the um, changes that that's going to mean both for Australian security and diplomacy and its ties with its Pacific neighbours. Um, there's a piece by Katarina Tiawa, who's also uh, here Tonight, fresh from Palau, um, Katarina looks at the threat that climate change is playing in, um, in the Pacific and not just to, to livelihoods and to landscapes there, but also to the culture and history and cultural memory there. It's a really powerful piece, I think, that, um, that makes clear why Pacific nations feel so strongly about the threat of climate change. It looks at what they're doing to respond and it looks at why they feel so let down by recent Australian government policy on climate change. There are also, um, there's also a piece by Jenny Hayward-Jones who looks at how Australian diplomats work in the Pacific. How does, how does Australia try to secure its interests in the Pacific? And she makes the point that um, it's traditionally or historically been quite easy for Australia in the Pacific. Australia's interests and the interests of its Pacific neighbours have been quite similar and that that is changing partly due to China's rise, partly due to climate change. The outlooks of Australia and its Pacific neighbours are, are starting to diverge and it's posing a real challenge to Australian diplomats working in the region. Um, and finally, we have an essay by Sean Dorney, who's a veteran ABC correspondent, spent a lot of time in Papua New Guinea, um, who looks at uh, Australia's forgotten colony, really. Uh, he, uh, uh, as he describes it, he shows how public and government interest in Papua New Guinea has declined and calls for a, a, an awakening um, or a new engagement between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Um, some other things that we have in, in, in this issue, um, just to mention, we have a regular feature called The Fix, which looks at a foreign policy problem and, and how to fix it. Um, and we have reviews that, uh, that look at um, North Korea, Indonesia, female foreign correspondents, um, and, uh, and there's also a great exchange in this issue between Clive Hamilton and Linda Javen, which I, I uh, <laughs> recommend. Um, uh, I just want to mention before I turn to the panel that uh, we are currently running our Next Voices competition for the second time. This is a, um, an effort really to find the new great voices in Australian foreign affairs, the future panellists. Um, and uh, it's open to students, academics, writers, journalists. Uh, I think there's information on our website, but uh, we're currently taking submissions now, so please uh, feel free to enter. Um, and I would, uh, I'd like now to introduce our panel for tonight. Um, so I'll start with Hugh, uh, who is a professor of strategic studies at ANU. He is a former Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Defence for Strategy and Intelligence. He's been a government advisor. He was the principal author of Australia's 2000 Defence White Paper, and he's also the principal author of his latest book, How to Defend Australia, um, uh, which, which uh, you've probably heard about recently. Um, so it's wonderful to have, have Hugh on the panel. Um, Associate Professor Katarina Tiawa, uh, who's... Um, uh, an expert on Pacific history and culture and, and language. Um, she is, I think, a really 
strong and insightful voice on the impact that climate change is having in the Pacific. Uh, and her main area of research has looked at the histories of British, Australian and New Zealand phosphate mining in the Central Pacific. We also have Dr Graham Smith, um, who is a fellow in the Department of Pacific Affairs at ANU. He has uh, studied Chinese investment, migration and aid across the Asia Pacific. Uh, and his voice may be familiar to you from the Little Red podcast, which he, which he co-hosts. Um, so, Graham, it's great to have you here tonight as well. Uh, and our moderator for tonight is Mary Louise O'Callaghan. Mary Louise is a journalist, um, a, a writer, a long-time observer and was resident in the, uh, in the Pacific. She's written for Australian Foreign Affairs. She's written a piece in a previous issue about Bougainville. Um, it's wonderful to have you here tonight, Mary Louise, up from Melbourne. Um, uh, and, uh, and I will soon turn over to your capable hands. Um, before I do, I just want to say um, thank you very much to Michael Wesley and Michelle Ferreira and the Coral Bell School for their organisation and their um, uh, um, hard work organising this event. So thank you very much to you and your, your team. Um, I will now turn over to you, Mary Louise, and, uh, and as I say, at the end, we will hear from James in response. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. I thought we'd, I'd kick off with a question that I'd ask all of you in turn. Uh, Jonathan, in his excellent and succinct editor's note at the beginning of this um, edition of Australian Foreign Affairs, suggested that, uh, or suggests that the success of the step up really depends on a resolution of a, a quite an obvious impasse on two what he describes as world-changing phenomena. China, uh, aggressive move into the region, and climate change, and the difference between Australia's view of that and the Pacific's. So I'd like to ask whether you agree and whether you do or don't, what's your advice to Scott Morrison? Hugh, we might start with you. Thanks, Emil. Uh, lovely to be here. Um, uh, look, um, wh whether or not what we're doing at the moment is going to succeed depends in very large measure on how well we've identified what the problem is we're trying to solve. I'm a sort of an old-fashioned bureaucrat at heart, and I do believe in defining the problem before you get too deeply into the solution. And uh, the point I'm trying to make in the essay in, in this edition um, is that if we conceive, the, from the China point of view, if we conceive the, 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 the task we face as being trying to preserve, or one might say resurrect, the traditional exclusive sphere of influence, the creation of which has been the foundation of Australia's policy towards the Southwest Pacific since, roughly speaking, the 1870s, if we approach the challenge that China's rise and China's growing influence in the region poses to us on the, by, by thinking what we need to do is to go back to the way we liked it in the old days, where we just keep potentially hostile major powers out of our backyard, then I think we're bound to fail. Because uh, I think China is just going to be too big, too influential, too attractive in some ways, though scary in others for that to be a viable model. And that means we need to reconceive our, the way we, we imagine our place in the region and the way we imagine China's place in the region um, and come up with a new model, let's use this phrase, a new, a new model of great power relations in the, uh, in the Southwest Pacific. On climate change, and I'm not the expert on this panel about climate change, let me tell you, but it, it, does, it does seem to me that again, <laughs> the same point applies. If the approach we take to the climate change aspect of our South Pacific problem is to see it as a way of managing the South Pacific rather than really taking climate change seriously, then I think we're screwed, if you'll forgive that technical diplomatic expression. Um, but they're not going to be fooled. Um, as, so, so we, the, 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 and, I don't, and I don't yet see that in Australian policy. Thank you. Katerina? Yeah, um, I think if we're going to identify problems, we need to recognise that 
climate change is an existential threat and China are not the first problems that the Pacific has had with global imperial powers wanting to play out their geostrategic priorities across the region. So I've just come from Palau where lots of people still remember World War II and don't like their experiences there. They're very, uh, they still very palpably feel the effects of living in a highly militarized um, island space, which matters a lot to countries on the rim, which don't take their feelings, priorities, lives, and histories seriously. Um, so lots of big things have already happened in the Pacific, from nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands, from nuclear testing in French Polynesia, from nuclear testing in Kiribati, from mining all over the region. So climate change is part of a continuum of very big things that have happened in the Pacific and Pacific Islanders since colonialism and imperialism have shown a lot of resilience and the ability to survive and thrive creatively in the force of global interests and global power plays in their region. And I think it's important that Australia truly takes seriously the Pacific's capacity to, to uh, live through and deal with those kinds of global forces. It is part of the resilience. I'm not saying there aren't problems on the ground. There are lots of problems. Pacific Island leaders, Pacific women will tell you there are lots of problems. But it's important that Australia think of the Pacific from uh, a framework which acknowledges the Pacific's own capacities, their own um, position of knowledge and authority on their own environments, their own histories, their own cultures, uh, and their own abilities to figure out what they want in the future. I think a real shift in this whole kind of deficit paradigm that has shaped Australian aid and development and diplomacy in the Pacific for a long time would be a new model. That would be a great new model. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not just speaking from a perspective of someone who's been doing Pacific studies for a long time in the region, but Australian National University scholars have identified this type of thinking that's been going on in Australia for a long time. So all of these new programs that are coming out through the Pacific Step Up are great. It's great that um, Australia is paying more attention to the region, but you can't just say, you have to show, you have to demonstrate a real shift in thinking. Um, one of the ways which could change the way, you know, the Pacific thinks about Australia if it, if, is if Pacific studies was done across Australia at all levels of schooling. You can learn Chinese and Japanese and Asian studies and <coughs> Korean in Australian primary schools and high schools, you can't learn barely anything about the Pacific. So how do you justify $1.4 billion being spent on the region when the Australian public can't get access to education and information about the Pacific? There's a whole range of things to be addressed and they're not just through the security or foreign policy or even aid and development lens. They're about education, they're about mutual understanding, they're about tourists going into the region, being better informed about where they're going, not just hanging out on Denaral in Fiji. <laughs> I could go on. Yeah. <laughs> You've actually just asked, answered my second question, but that's all right. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sure she can find a new answer to the same question. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, what, what more can I add to that? And also, I have to admit to being a complete fraud because unlike these two, I haven't actually written anything for this volume. Um, so I suspect not for the first time in my career, I'm here to channel Jenny Hayward-Jones, um, <laughs> something I've had to do on, on, on numerous occasions. Um, I guess to, to go to your question about what advice would I give to Scott Morrison about these two thorny issues, um, my simple advice would be climate change is definitely coming for you, China maybe not. Um, so deal with the inevitability rather than the probability. Um, but on both issues, uh, there is a limitation to what you can do. And, and it comes down to a domestic factor on climate change in that he's held hostage to certain forces within his party that will not allow him to move seriously on climate change. And um, 
you can read Katarina's essay for any you know examples from a specific perspective of just how badly that plays. To give you one example, tying the two together, though, um, I sat down in 2014 with the um, Chinese Economic Councillor for Papua New Guinea, and he was a very wily kind of career bureaucrat or career <coughs> diplomat, if you like. Um, and he, um, the purpose of the task force it was Chinese, Pacific and Australian coming together to say, what can we cooperate on in the Pacific? What are some aid projects that China, Australia and Papua New Guinea can work on? And he got this big Cheshire grin on his face and he said, how about climate change? <laughs> and this was 2014, so things were even yeah. uh, darker back then. Mm. Um, so, and on the China side of things, I guess my, my caution to him would be don't assume linearity. Um, there are things happening domestically um, within China and also beyond China's borders in Hong Kong that are catching the attention of um, many people in the Pacific. I'm just back from Solomon Islands, and before I went there, I was, a sh I was pretty sure they're going to switch to um, the recognition mm. to China. After spending a bit of time there, I wasn't so sure. And part of it was more than one MP, who were the guys who have the, and literally the guys who have the say on this, um, said to me, the China of today is not the China of three years ago. So there's an awareness that things are changing domestically within China, and it what is changing, particularly around persecution of Christians, is not playing terribly well in the Pacific. So I wouldn't assume linearity, and I would not assume that China really cares that much about the Pacific. Well, I was going to ask you that. Is China actually grooming the Pacific? Is there, are there intentions that sinister? Uh, look, there are intentions, and they're pretty brassy. Um, so in Seoul, for example, <laughs> an SOE, um, known affectionately as um, CCECC, China, China, everything, China, China, um, <laughs> directly shirt front of the Prime Minister and more or less said to him, um, here's an MOU that we're going to have ready for you, close the business if you like, half a billion dollars, you know what you need to do to make this MOU happen, Prime <coughs> Minister. Um, so that kind of very ballsy Sorry, the direct half approach. For Solomon Islands half a B Solomon was for Solomon Islands. Uh, okay. Sogavari, Just checking. Yeah, no, look, he already has his discretionary front from Taiwan, so mm. um, you know they would probably have to match that too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's 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 both covert and extremely overt. I mean, this, there wasn't any great secret of this uh, of this approach. Um, but on the other side, you have. <laughs> And, and this is one thing I, I found a little surprising about um, Hughes' essay is, is there was this intimation that under the Trump administration, America was, was withdrawing from the Pacific. And the kind of uh, you know, quite crude diplomacy that America was practicing in Solomon Islands, like literally the White House on the phone, National Security Council on the phone saying, don't switch, don't switch. Um, you know, this kind of really upfront, no, 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 you know, we, we're getting actively involved, mm -hmm. um, marks a huge change, I think, from, from America's behaviour. I don't think Australia has gone there yet, um, but, you know, it's, it, it seems that, at, at least going by that evidence, that under Trump, it's kind of the reverse. Like, they might even be waiting out Trump in some sense mm -hmm. in the Pacific before they switch to China. This I mean, US signed up Solomon Islands to the Coalition of the Willing without actually checking if they wanted to be in the Coalition of the Willing. Maybe John Howard signed us up, I don't know. <laughs> Hugh, do you want to have, respond to any of that? Well, I think um, a, a very, very good point, and obviously one wants to be very careful not to oversimplify the China story because it is the most complicated story in the world. Um, you know, we've never seen a country go through such astonishing transformations. Its political system is in a very strange place at the moment. Uh, its economy is going through an immensely complex transition and there's a lot that's unknown about its strategic and diplomatic agenda. But having said that, I'm gonna make a few rationalizations anyway. And that is, I, I do think it's a very prudent, you know, working hypothesis for Australia and for that matter for other countries in, uh, in our part of the world that China's objective is to become the leading power, at least in East Asia and the Western Pacific. Now, I, I don't much like the phrase Indo-Pacific because I think that, that, that is a clumsy way of dealing with the way the region's actually working. But it does seem to me very, very plausible that China, as part of that um, ambition to become the leading power, the hegemonic power, if you like, in East Asia and the Western Pacific, that does include the Southwest Pacific. Mm. Um, and this is, this is new and different. We haven't seen an Asian power seek to establish that kind of role in our part of the world since the 1940s. Mm. 
or the 1930s. Or actually, you might take it back to mm. Japan's ambitions to take over the former German colonies in the in the First World War. But this is, you know, this is not something we've seen for a while. And so it's a little bit tempting to think that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore. Mm. Well, part of my message is, yes, it does. Mm. This is the whole point. This is everything, everything uh, old is new again. We're going mm. back to a very traditional, I think it's the, the, most, the best way to understand what we're seeing in the South of the Pacific is a very traditional style of great power politics. Now, and I'm, I think it's pretty clear what China's trying to do. Now, it's, it's, it's not a short-term process, so I'm not saying that they're deeply impatient and determined that it's going to happen very quickly. Um, but, uh, but over 20 or 30 or 40 years, which actually in the grand sweep of history isn't that long, um, I think their ambitions are pretty plain. So a very important question is, what's America doing about it? And I agree the signals out of Washington, I put it mildly, very mixed, because on the one hand, we have had over the last couple of years, really, especially since the national security strategy of December 2017, a lot of noise out of Washington. It looks like America really pushing back in a very determined way and getting on the phone to on the R at, um, shirt fronting them, if I may use that diplomatic expression, over their uh, thinking plans to switch recognition. That's part of that picture. Uh, as is, uh, you know, Pence's appearance at, at APEC, the willingness of the United States to partner with Australia in developing uh, the m facility at Manus mm -hmm. and so on. But I've got to say, my I'm very doubtful that the America, that the United States has the long-term capacity or will to defeat China's ambitions in our part of the world. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of lot, lot more to say about that, but I, I think the, 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 short, the short version of it is that China is, um, it, just because of the scale of its economy, is the most powerful rival the United States has ever encom encompassed, encountered and it's operating on its home ground. If they were competing over who was the dominant power in the Middle East or who was the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere, like, that'd be a very different thing. But China, with the power that it has derived from its economy uh, and the fact that it's operating in its own backyard, I think is gonna be very hard for the United States to beat. In other words, it will cost the United States a great deal. And I have seen no evidence that the United States has the will to commit the resources and accept the risks required to defeat China's ambitions in the Western Pacific. And for that reason, that's why I think Australia has to start thinking about not how do we stop China dominating the Western Pacific and East Asia, but how do we live with it? Right. And for us, a very big part of that is how do we live with it in the Southwest Pacific? Katerina, I'd be interested to know, I think there's an assumption often in the debate in Australia that there is a homogeneous view in the Pacific about China and Chinese. Um, mm. There's been a history of migration there um, during the colonial period. Tell us about Pacific views. I'm sure there's more than one. I'm not an expert <laughs> on China um, or on China and the Pacific, and not particularly one on states and what states do mm. and, and, and thinking of states as these thinking, <laughs> uh, breathing things. I'm more of a people. Well, tell us what I focus the, on people and the people culture. you know. What, but the sort I, of things I mean, think. I went to a Chinese school in Fiji, so maybe my views are shaped more by my experiences growing up in Fiji in a Chinese school. And it's often hard for me to think of China mm. as this homogenous, non-diverse kind of hegemonic well, thing. Think, yeah. um, when I've grown up with so many diverse Chinese who have migrated to the Pacific at different times. And there's, you know, talk, uh, Pacific Islanders talk about the old Chinese families and the new Chinese, mm -hmm. and there's different, very different perspectives mm -hmm. on those groups. But there's a lot of um, cross-cultural exchanges that are going on on the ground. You know, um, Taiwan has a very different uh, approach to the Pacific. Um, I mean, which even China can claim as well in terms of, um, ancestral connections to the Pacific, which both archaeology and linguistics have backed up um, through their research. So there's many ways to talk about China in the Pacific. There's many ways to talk about Chinese influences in the Pacific. And I think in the same way that we shouldn't conflate um, states and state governments with people um, and the diversity of people, diversity of um, 
you know, lifestyles and social, political, economic and cultural ways of being in the world, mm -hmm. whether we do it with respect to Australia mm -hmm. or with respect to China, um, I think we just have to be careful about that. So when I hear uh, media discourse and political discourse that automatically kind mm -hmm. of conflates people uh, with states, I, it um, brings in red flags for me. Mm -hmm. It's the same when people talk about Nauru and automatically conflate Nauru with a particular kind of uh, discourse about refugee detention. Mm. Nauru is a Pacific country with a history and a culture mm. and a people. Um, China is a place with a particular diverse uh, history and cultures and experiences. Um, so I think it's important, again, in terms of how we talk about different kinds of dynamics um, in the region and just be careful with our language. Just be careful with our framing. Mm. Framing is everything and just not conflate those sorts of um, levels of discourse. Yeah, mm. thank you. Just picking up on Nauru and, and Manus for that matter, uh, it's not something that's addressed in this edition, but I'm personally curious, having been to both those places and seen how they've been vilified as a result of that policy. Um, whether you think there's been an impact in the Pacific in terms of Pacific Islanders' attitude towards Australia and its role in basically using Nauru and Manus in that way. In the piece that I wrote, I, I particularly wanted to amplify other kinds of Nauruan voices. Mm. That was deliberate in my essay. Um, my quoting of Marlene Moses mm -hmm. um, and also the, the president of Nauru singing to Jacinda Arden, congratulating her on the birth of her child. Um, that was my response to what I see constantly in social and mainstream media as this, um, you know, this framing of Nauru as this backwards kind of hellhole in the Pacific. I think it's horribly unfair to Nauru and people and Nauru has a particularly uh, challenging history that it's gone through uh, with World War II and phosphate mining and being a German colony before that. And I just think it's really important for Australians to have deep knowledge of particular um, islands and cultures before they automatically tag <laughs> the entire, you know, entire nations mm. to certain kinds of um, negative discourses. I have students in this room, wonderful ANU honors students in this room who are doing work on that, going into deep archival work to tell Nauruan stories differently. Um, and I know there's a lot of interest in Nauru amongst NGOs and all kinds of groups. And I just implore people to actually get a better and deeper understanding of Manus um, and Nauru. And I think there are some better stories that are coming out about Manus, but I don't see don't similarly see coming out about Nauru. People uh, like to think that, oh, because of phosphate mining, everybody got rich and then they didn't manage their affairs well and then everything tanked. Oh boy, these people don't know how to manage their affairs. You know, that's a really simplistic view about it. Just, you know, taking the refugee detention center issue uh, and separating it just slightly from the experiences of people uh, on the ground, um, we should have compassion for all kinds of different people who are existing in that space with their particular histories <coughs> and struggles and challenges. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is humanize everyone. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's important to humanize Nauruans and Manus Islanders and refugees and everybody else trying to make a positive difference um, on the ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hugh, what about the impact on the relationship with Papua New Guinea on Kevin Rudd's decision to... Well, um, it did, it, it seems to me one of the decisive features of our relationships with the South Pacific and in a sense particularly with PNG because of the legacy of our own direct colonial engagement there is that um, uh, we have a we've, we've had a long cycle of periods of neglect punctuated by periods of acute attention and the Sounds acute like attention failing marriage well, well, <laughs> well and the acute attention can always be identified by Australia having a problem and, and therefore, when something goes wrong, um, Australia turns up and tries to get PNG to fix it for them. 
And, uh, you know, it seemed to me that um, the... Uh, uh, the one, one, one of the things that was, quite apart from the, the actual problems that were, that were caused on Manus and the constitutional dramas as to whether or not it was legal and all of that, um, which in itself were very significant, um, uh, there was, in terms of its impact on the relationship, there was this sort of quintessential, here we go again, um, Australia is just reaching out and trying to grab something, um, trying to make something work for us. And it does seem to me that one of the challenges we're facing at the moment is that we're seeing another quite acute cycle of that. What, what, why, why have we got to step up? Why, why suddenly have we got this big rush to um, revitalise our relationships with PNG and other countries in the South West Pacific? And the answer is... The answer is China, and it does seem to me that's a very, it's a bad place for us to be starting from. <laughs> the fact is that we have had, we found it very difficult, going all the way back to 1975 and, and independence. We found it very difficult to build a sustained, constructive, respectful engagement with Papua New Guinea, uh, which, pr which persists between the crises, and um, and th that. It, and that means we're, 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 as we face, as we do for the first time since 1975, a, what it seems to me to be a genuine strategic challenge to our long-term interests, uh, strategic interests in that part of the world, we start off with a, from a very bad place. We don't we don't start off with a lot of with a lot of money in the bank, and uh, and I think that that's um, e e even if, as I said, I th I, th I think our our overall approach is misconceived because I think our objective is wrong. But even if that objective was right, I think the, the legacy of that episodic engagement, episodic and self-centred engagement, um, would make it very hard for us to achieve a good outcome. I just, I just want to add to that because I think part of the problem as well has been that the Southwest Pacific, which Australia tends to know best and is closest to, shapes Australia's yeah. entire no. No, approach right. yeah. <laughs> to the whole Pacific. Mm. So um. Australia is going to be opening, as I understand, you can confirm embassies in the Marshall Islands and Palau. Mm. So where, what is the starting place for knowledge mm. Mm. on the Marshall Islands and Palau in Australia, which, where the research and the policy work has been constantly focused on its closest neighbours, in the Southwest Pacific, and the Southwest Pacific is constantly used as the framework to to understand and and deal with the rest of the Pacific. That also has to shift. You need genuine knowledge and engagement of the whole Pacific in all its Micronesian, Melanesian, and Polynesian diversity, including challenging and critiquing those uh, cultural terms as well. But I think this idea that you know everything because you know a corner of it, hmm. and do you know a cor that corner of it so well? Um, that's part of the problem in Australia's um, approach on a number of levels. So you can't roll out programs that are great for seven million people and all of these other bigger countries with that particular environment on small uh, atolls or on rock islands hmm. or on you know, archipelagic <laughs> kinds of, um, you know, th there's so much diversity in the mm. Pacific. The Pacific is genuinely and truly one big <laughs> kinship group. You know, this, this is important. I want to make sure I say that, but it's also super diverse. Mm. So one of the amazing things about the Pacific is that diversity and unity <coughs> coexist and people know how to operate in that kind of environment. Sometimes the diversity in the Pacific is seen as the source of the development problem. Too many different clans, too many different tribes, too many different groups can't get along. Can we just have like one universalist approach to this group? No, diversity is a strength in the Pacific. That's how they've survived for 40,000 years over here and you know 3,000 years over there. So again, you have to kind of shift this thinking about you know, what are the actual strengths of the people in this part of the world. Mm. Graham, did you want to add something? Yeah, look, um, just to come back to something Hugh um, said a little bit earlier, and, and I actually agree with Hugh's central thesis in the book that the, the question of why would China build a base in the Pacific, and I think he's the first person I've come across to give a straight and interesting and possibly correct answer, um, which is because they can or because they think they can. I think that's a great answer to the question. 
what I'm not so sure of, and this kind of leads on from, from Katerina's discussion about, about knowledge, is um, whether there exists, um, whether the Southwest Pacific is China's backyard. I'm really not convinced. If it is a backyard, it's one they, they need a torch to kind of have a look at um, because the knowledge base within China in, uh, of Pacific studies um, is incredibly low. Um, one illustration of this was um, in 2014, China does five-year country plans for every Pacific country now, which is kind of a big deal. Um, so I shared uh, a, a room with the guy who was doing the, uh, the five-year country plan for Tonga. Um, and until uh, a week before he arrived in Tonga, he was under the impression he was going to Togo. Uh, so, you know, a, a, a little way to go yeah, on yeah. the knowledge base. And look, yeah. there is investment being made, yes. but, but yeah. it takes a yeah. long, long time for, yeah. uh, for this to, to figure in the, in yeah. the, in the consciousness. Yeah. And certainly after APEC, um, you know, it's in there. But the mere fact that the, the Pacific was kind of tacked on to the Belt and Road Initiative, like yeah. it was tacked yeah. on a year later. I mean, if it was core, a core strategic interest, to borrow the, yeah. the Chinese phrase, um, it would have been in there from the start. So I'm just not entirely convinced. But, but all of Katerina's points about diversity also imply to the Chinese community in the Pacific. Um, so I mean, what I do is I hang out in shops and talk to these guys from Fujian and these guys from Guangdong, and their backstories are fascinating. You know, and they are not on a page with the Chinese state at all. Yeah. Um, they don't want the Solomon Islands to switch to Taiwan for the simple reason that, yeah, yeah, sorry, to China, um, for the simple reason that they're happy with the status quo and if the switch happens, there'll be more competition. There'll yes, be more Chinese yes, shopkeepers yeah. arriving. <laughs> so, um, you know, yeah, they actually true. bail up MPs yeah. and say, yeah. please vote for yeah. Taiwan. And they're looking yeah. at them going, what? Don't you yeah. want an embassy? Yeah. Uh, and they're like, no, 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 no embassy. Please, please, please. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's very yeah. diverse. And in some ways, to, I really liked in your essay that you have these the historical parallels. Yeah. And what I see there is, in a sense, it's a little bit more like the British East India Company yes, in yes, that the commercial yes. actors are so yes. far ahead of the yes. state. Yes. Um, and the yeah. state is kind of very reluctantly being yeah. dragged along. And the educational yeah. institutions, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. maybe Katarina can spend yeah. some time over there, but gee, they, they're a long way behind. Yes. Like, yes. There's, there's yes. a lot of catching yes. up to do. Yeah. I just have a little yeah. counter to the Togo. <laughs> Tonga um, example, um, we, we visited um, an agency in Palau um, whose work was in gender, and they were talking about how Australia was pouring all of this money into gender equality and gender equity, which everyone assumes is, you know, an excellent and great kind of program that needs to be rolled out all across the Pacific. And Palau is a matriarchal society. And women call a lot of the shots. <laughs> and there is a balance of power uh, enshrined in culture between men and women, which had been working pretty well until colonialism came along. Mm. So um, the gender affairs officers that we were talking to were saying, you know, there's all this money being poured into, talk about knowledge bases, right? Poured into gender equality and equity and Julie Bishop and, um, you know, members of the Labour Party were all there and they were promoting <laughs> gender equity and equality while the most senior matriarch of Palau, who kind of has <laughs> these things, uh, I wouldn't say always under control, but has the kind of cultural authority that most women in most countries don't have, um, you know, women on the ground are kind of like, what? so you want us to like cut and paste this gender equity, gender equality stuff into a context in which women who, whose authority is derived from the tarot patches that they cultivate and where they're trying to figure out new approaches because climate change and saltwater inundation is filling those tarot patches, you want us to cut and paste this model of gender equality and equity. How about you support us to figure out our own approach? And that's something that is needed across multiple sectors in the Pacific, whether you're talking about building roads through the terrains of Papua New Guinea highlands that if you use the same model from Australia, frankly, it just won't work, you know? Like, you can't just cut and paste kinds of things. So Australian knowledge base also needs a wee bit of work. And sometimes people think, you know, something like gender equality and gender equity is just like an automatic tick. Like, of course, everybody wants that in the same exact way. No, of course, people are interested in 
you know, and stopping domestic violence and all kinds of, you know, things that are happening on the ground. But you have to honor the fact that people have some sense of agency and knowledge in these spheres and have them work from that base, not some universalist, cut and paste international kind of template. Just coming back to climate change, uh, you pointed out, and I think Jenny Hayward-Jones also points out in her piece, that Australian governments work pretty hard to keep climate change out of the annual um, for Pacific Island Forum leaders communiques until last year when we signed up. What's the bottom line, do you think? I'm, I'm sure the Pacific are watching closely as to whether Australia and particularly Scott Morrison as part of the step up is going to walk the walk or just keep talking the talk. What would you say is the bottom line there? They have to honour well, what they the signed up to. A couple, <laughs> when is the forum? It's in a couple of months, a yeah, month? It's in Tuvalu, is that right? Yeah. 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 In August? Yeah. Another yeah. Taiwan ally. So... Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to be a fly on the wall, <laughs> you know, in those discussions. And I hope Pacific leaders just ask him flat out what's going on. Mm. You signed up to this in Nauru. Uh, we all agreed that climate change is an existential threat. Uh, we put it at the top of mm. the top. Mm. of the agenda, um, it, it's straightforward. Mm. It's very straightforward. Take it seriously or not. I mean, I'm sure people will say, yes, we have, are funding all of these programs through the Pacific Step Up and all of this stuff, but it's not just about what you're doing in the islands. The islands aren't causing climate change. Mm. Mm. You know, it's, it's Western and Eastern and industrial lifestyles, it's consumption levels, it's the reliance on fossil fuels, mm. it's the lack of investment in alternative energy, it's the continuing funding of coal mines. Mm. So, you know, a bunch of ad adaptation programs is not, mm. that's like a band-aid. Well, it's popping up. It's yeah, not really it's, and popular. it's not very nice. Mm. It's not very nice for the Pacific. Do you guys have any advice for Scott on this? Well, as I to go back to what well, I touched on and answered your first question, I think, and exactly as Katarina says, in the end, the answer to, the answer to Australia is um, improving its credentials on issue issue in the South Pacific is what it does in Australia. Mm. Yeah, and Here. and that's that's not a that's not a foreign policy question. It's not yeah. a made policy question. It's a domestic, domestic. energy policy question. Mm. Um, and uh, with all of that, with all of that's entailed in that, mm. in terms of Australian politics. And I'd just add, there's one thing I think often gets missed um, in terms of, I think, Australia's settings, it's, it's almost the reverse of China. I think Australia's settings internally, domestically, are abysmal. Like, yeah. I mean, how we scrapped a carbon tax that was working uh, just beggars belief, whereas China is putting in place um, a system, uh, you know, a proper emissions trading system, taking all kinds of efforts to, to promote renewable energy. But paradoxically, in Solomon Islands, they are the driver behind Solomon Islands being logged at 19 yes, times yes, its sustainable yes, rate. Yes, so yes, they're applying standards yes, at home, but they're not applying them abroad. Yes, yes, um, so, so I think an important distinction needs to be yes, made that, yes, you know, at home, they're definitely heading towards being a good guy. Their emissions yeah. have, have peaked and they're starting to, to head down. Yeah. But abroad, they can be a very destructive actor, yeah. um, and in the Pacific in particular. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, Pacific Blue, Meg Taylor's um, articulated yeah. and spoken about that quite eloquently. Yeah. How powerful <coughs> an agency do you think that can be in, in the relationship with Australia? So my understanding of the blue Pacific and this thinking about the Pacific as a blue continent is a long time coming response to a consistent approach to the Pacific where size doesn't matter, mm. where the scale is too small and who cares about 10,000 people and 90,000 people and 40,000 people and it's this idea that uh, foreign powers and Pacific Rim countries have been able to play out their geostrategic priorities in, across an ocean where there's only a small number of people in small islands and small landscapes. So it's a reframing of that uh, fairly consistent global thinking. But the genealogy of that, aside from a policy consultant who actually started putting that language into 
you know, documents for, for the Pacific Forum actually comes back to an ANU graduate from um, anthropology <coughs> uh, from ANU in the 1970s, Professor Epeli Haofa, mm -hmm. who did his PhD in anthropology uh, in Papua New Guinea, who is of Tongan descent, who's now passed away. Mm -hmm. But he started talking about the Pacific as our sea of islands. Not mm -hmm. islands in a far sea, mm -hmm. but an entire sea of islands. And what he was trying to do at the time when he wrote it in 1993 was challenge this framing of the Pacific as small place that doesn't matter, mm -hmm. where there was this constant deficit view. Mm -hmm. They are backwards, they are underdeveloped, they need help from great saviors, to come through and give them money so that they can be better. So he wrote that in direct response to, I think, an ANU paper. <laughs> I think it was Rowan Kallick. I mentioned it in my essay, which talked about the Pacific being so small and everything backwards and everything going to hell and it's, you know, all unstable. So now it's fascinating because when he wrote it at the time, Our Sea of Islands, and he wrote it because he was telling his students at the University of the South Pacific that they were backwards mm. and they were like this is really depressing why is our professor telling us this and he was just parroting discourse that was coming not just out of Australia but other parts of the world and he suddenly realized what the heck am I doing to my students what am I telling them mm. that they're not good enough mm. so he wrote it then and all these critiques came, came out and they said uh, that's really impractical and idealistic. That will never fly. That is like the soft power approach that is really not going to, you know, have an impact. So now in 2019, and I wish he was here, you know, to, to see that the forum and Pacific leaders are talking about big ocean states, big islands. He was talking about how Pacific Islanders had been crossing the seas for thousands of years and they knew this space and valued this space better than anyone else. Mm. The ocean was part of the people, the mm. land was part of the people. Mm. So now the forum is using that language. I mean, they were using it back when um, Hillary Clinton went to the Cook Islands and she was like, the Pacific is big enough for us all. Uh, <laughs> and I think it included China and France and everyone else who rocked up to the Cook Islands. So now they're countering that negative discourse, which was quite belittling with, mm. no, we're big, we're actually big. Mm. And really the Pacific is one third of the planet. It's mm. massive, mm. it's absolutely massive. And when people are talking about small islands and small uh, populations, they completely forget that those populations know how to live in that massive, massive environment and have values and stories and histories that extend across those spaces. They're not confined to the islands. They're not small, isolated dots. People were crisscrossing across them for thousands of years. So that's that framing of the Pacific as this big blue continent, which has that particular genealogy is utterly fascinating. And I think that story needs to be told, like it can't just be plopped into the, you know, into the papers now and, and suddenly you're talking about a big, big ocean. There's a particular history to that um, challenge to the framing of the Pacific as a small place, which I think is important for people to know about. And it's not just a Pele Haofa, there are other scholars who were talking about that over the years, but they were always dismissed as idealists. But now there's pragmatic value in speaking that way. Hugh, uh, your experience as a bureaucrat, would you say that, that the Blue Pacific can get some traction? Well, it's, 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 I was very interested in that, in that um, backstory, which I think is real. it's a really fascinating story about the way these concepts evolve. I think part of my understanding of it, and this comes partly from conversations with Meg Taylor about it, um, is it sort of on top of that or laid alongside it, um, or perhaps just following up serendipitously behind it, is the idea of the Blue Pacific as a counter to the Indo-Pacific as a strategic concept. There's a lot of, and, and, and what's behind that is this, Indo-Pacific is, is, is absolutely a, uh, a strategic concept. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, that, there's a, I actually think it is a fabrication. Fabrication. But, it, but, but, it's, but, it's a, but I, think it's a, I think it's a dysfunctional strategic concept, but I think Meg's point is that she wants, uh, she's looking for the, the people of the South Pacific are looking for a way of conceiving the region which is not primarily strategic to start with. 
And I think the idea of using that as an alternative um, frame to push back against the securitization, the strategization, is that a word? Um, uh, embodied in the concept of the Indo-Pacific. And, and it's partly a way of saying, look, those issues, those sort of great power strategic issues, are not the most important issues for us. Mm. We, and we therefore don't want to use a conceptual framework which puts that, which has those at the forefront. Mm. And so this alternative conception um, was available for the reasons you just, you know, spelled out. Um, and so I think it's quite significant as a repudiation of the strategic focus uh, that's embedded in the Indo-Pacific concept. Whether it has a chance of taking up, well, that, I mean, this gets to a really deep point, which has been uh, raised by a lot of the things Katarina said, and that is that when we look at a region like the South Pacific, or for that matter, any region, um, we do see it functioning in different ways. The, 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 level of, the level of analysis of how states are behaving is, at, is only one level. Um, but it is a level which, which embodies great capacity for good and great capacity for harm. Uh, nothing screws a region up like states really misbehaving. And, you know, the experience of the Pacific War, for example, is an absolutely proof, you know, that happened because this part of the world became, for interesting reasons, for a while, the focus of one of the great strategic contests and enormous amounts of state power, you know, crashed into of tiny regions and, um, you know, with enormous and long-lasting effects which are still with us to this day. And so I think um, the, the, it, to the extent that the Blue Pacific concept is an attempt to say we just want to opt out of that whole strategic story, I don't think it's going to get traction. I think, you know, to paraphrase Trotsky, you not, you might not be interested in grand strategy, but grand strategy is interested in you. <laughs> um, uh, but to the extent, but so I think that it's not, it's not going to, I think it's unlikely to work to displace a strategic, a strategic concept. But the idea that we should not allow that to be the only frame of reference, and the idea that in fact, if, if, if we allow that to be the only frame of reference, if we, if we base our entire approach to our immediate neighbourhood on that strategic conception, we're going to miss out on an opportunity to actually build our influence and, and role there for all of the reasons that gather in. I think that's right. So I think, I, I, I think the Blue Pacific is a concept that Australia needs to take very seriously. I don't think we should be so optimistic as to think it completely displaced a strategic perspective. And I see in the Australian this morning, Ben Packham's story yes. um, about finally the establishment of something that's been talked about for a long time, a Pacific support force in Brisbane, which will bring presumably police and military from the region down for training. Do you know much about that? I, I don't. Um, uh, I, it, it, it rang a lot of bells with me because exactly as you say, it's an idea that's been kicking around in different forms, including Sir Julius Chan's mm -hmm. idea of a- Pacific force. Pacific force. If, if, that's what's con if that's what's conceived, then there could be you know, there could be something in it. I don't think it's going to be um, uh, a, 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 big, a big deal in itself. Uh, in the end, these are just policy instruments. Um, but I do, uh, but it, if, it, if it was done in a way which really um, provided, it re really meant that Australia and others were supporting the countries of the Southwest Pacific to build their capacity to deal with security problems by themselves, then that would be a good step in the right direction. What do you think, Katarina? I think what Australia needs to do is have complementary programs that are focused on more cultural diplomacy type relations running along all of this funding, uh, police and different forces. I mean, I come from Fiji, which is a pretty mm. militarized mm. <laughs> space. We got police yeah. and military coming out of our ears. So it's great yeah. to build their capacity. Um, but what you need is better, in order to build better kinship with the Pacific, okay? Scott Morrison, um, bless his heart, yes, is, yes. likes talking about family and all of those good things. Um, in order to build better kinship-based relations, you've got to fund other kinds of programs along with all of these other programs. And they need to focus on the media, they need to focus on 
um, culture, arts, heritage, sports, and all of these things that Pacific people care about and give them a strong sense of efficacy and agency. Okay, so the kinds of different things that are funded are really, really important. I believe at one time, culture was a big like N-O in AusAid. Like if you wanted to find culture, find some other angle to get in there. But if they could fund programs that were actually more meaningful culturally on the ground, alongside with all of these other things, that would change, help change the nature of Australia's relationship with the region. The Pacific would actually recognize that as a meaningful thing. Um, but Australia's participation in the Festival of Pacific Arts is a good thing and needs to continue. The P Festival of Pacific Arts, which happens every four years, which I mentioned briefly um, in this article, is something that was set up through the Secretariat of the Pacific Community because Pacific Islanders said, we want that and we need that. We need to protect our languages, our heritage, our arts, our cultures. These are not frivolous things that are somehow like icing on the cake of like really meaningful institutions of governance and security and all of that. They're integrated. So the reason the Festival of Pacific Arts happens every four years and the reason it's not for tourists, it's for each other, <laughs> is to solidify and deepen those kinship relations between the countries of the Pacific. And Australia always participates through its indigenous uh, contingent, New Zealand participates as well, but indigenous artists from Australia sort of, you know, they have to figure it out themselves and bring themselves there, whereas New Zealand usually puts everyone like on an Air Force jet <laughs> and goes to the Festival of Pacific Arts because they take it seriously. Mm. They've got their ministers of commerce, they've mm. got like the Maori king, <laughs> they've got everybody on the Air Force jet, whereas Australia's like, oh, off, you know, Australia Council, off you go take your little contingent to the Festival of Pacific Arts, whereas New Zealand brings like everybody and their mother, you know, because the New Zealand Prime Minister is often also the Minister for Culture. Mm. So that's taking culture seriously, mm. right? And it's also a reflection of Australia's relationships with its indigenous peoples versus mm. New Zealand's relationships yep. with its indigenous people. Mm. So changing and deepening and making those relationships better in Australia helps the perception in the Pacific. The Pacific goes, how does Australia treat its own indigenous people? We're indigenous peoples. We are all part of that indigenous family in the region. That makes a huge difference to perception and to these warm, friendly feelings between the island countries of Australia. Thanks, Graham. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that. And it's something you, you touch on in your essay, um, almost in a hopeful way that, that Pacific voices can have more of an influence in policy making circles in Australia. And I think, um, I mean, it's a really interesting distinction with New Zealand. Uh, I mean, we're here patting ourselves on the back. Oh, the first Aboriginal minister uh, in, in the government, my goodness. And meanwhile, New Zealand has four Pacific Islanders, um, you know, as ministers. And a ministry for Pacific Island affairs. Yeah. And, and it's a simple, it, it simply comes down to demographics in that there are electorates in New Zealand that hang on the Pacific vote. And they simply, are not. I mean, as a result of historical migration policies, I mean, the number of Papua New Guineans in Australia is ridiculously small. It's what, exactly. 20,000 20, or so? Yeah. That's not going to get not any enough. politician's yeah. attention. Yeah. That's right. Um, and it's a really crucial difference in the way Australia engages and the way New Zealand engages. New Zealand cares because it is a Pacific nation, you yeah. know? The governments are decided by the Pacific vote, not in Australia. Um, yeah. I was going to open up for questions now. I'll just off with the last one, which is um, for the panel. Given that, how much of a game changer is Australia's commitment to recently announced as part of the step up the Pacific Islands, um, what's it called, the job scheme? Labor How much of a, a game changer can that be? It's, it's important, but it's not the whole, you know, it can't be the full the full thing. I think it's now gone up to three years, uh, a mo labor mobility scheme that allows people to come over to work, work it's gone in from being a pilot. Yeah, to from being a pilot a, to yeah, being a full blown yeah. scheme. That's okay, mm -hmm. yeah. but Papua New Guinea is a former colony of Australia. Mm -hmm. There should be way more pathways for Papua New Guineans 
to be able to migrate and settle in Australia. Lots of former colonial countries do that with their former colonies. People from those colonies can come and settle, live and work in the former colonial um, power. So why couldn't Australia figure that out? That would be a good friendship move, uh, big time. The other issue then is, Federal level needs to work more with state level because state level uh, is the level at which people are constantly thinking about culturally and linguistically diverse communities, the called communities, and that's where Pacific Islanders are. There are lots of Pacific Islanders in New South Wales mm -hmm. and in uh, Queensland and uh, all over Australia. We constantly see them on the rugby league uh, and rugby fields. Um, so why can't federal level thinking about the Pacific also move to that domestic space where the voices and the experiences of Pacific Islanders here also matter? I don't think it's just an issue of, oh, but their numbers are a little bit small. They're actually not that small. And when you add the descendants of South Sea Islanders to that, so we already have Pacific Islanders who've been through here through some other <laughs> not so great labor mobility really scheme, scheme. <laughs> not so good one, but they're here and they're part of the Australian landscape and they actually work quite closely often with indigenous communities. All of that should now be relevant for federal level thinking about the Pacific. They're all, the Paci they're all Pacific. Tongans in Melbourne and Tongans in Sydney and Samoans and Fijians who live here are just as Pacific as the Pacific out there. So our research about the Pacific can't just be about the Pacific over there. It's not over there, it's over here. It's over here in Australia. And that means also the face of Pacific expertise in Australia also has to change. There needs to be more Pacific Islanders sitting up here talking about the Pacific. It's a good note to pause, I think, and invite James to respond before questions. I think one of the things that um, that it demonstrates, that this conversation demonstrates, is the complexity. Like, it, we started on foreign policy and we relatively quickly moved into domestic angles. Um, we, you know, we've talked economics, we've talked culture. And I think what that demonstrates is uh, uh, we know that um, Pacific Step Up, we know that the objectives of Pacific Step Up are not uh, a simple sort of binary switch that is amenable to simple additional funding. And this is the whole um, spirit of that, of creating that office, is about understanding that even the bureaucratic complexity of getting greater knowledge and greater understanding and greater effectiveness in the way that we work. So I think it's, it's always, you can't have enough conversations like this and you can't have enough input from people outside the system particularly people with knowledge and with deep knowledge about the system. Um, I wanted to, to take a show of hands to see um, how many people out here are, are working uh, for the Australian government on Pacific issues. And I know who you are. So That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so That's what is that, yeah. about 5% yeah. of yeah. the audience? Yeah. Okay, so there's, yeah. the point yeah. being yeah. that That's people are point. coming yeah. along yeah. because yeah. they want to hear. These are people who are going back who have some agency within within the system so i like the i like the the the, the concept of debate and i i think it's um it's clear that in order to effectively deliver step up we are going to have to learn including from conversations like this um, we are not the finished article and and to the best of my knowledge you don't get air miles on these things so the fact that our leaders are taking or do you hear? You probably no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. You get, you get hearing defects. You, you don't get. get, get... <laughs> so the reason people, are, our leaders, um, uh, are in the region is not to to get access to a better lounge. It is partly to to learn, and we shouldn't underestimate the 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 passion of the prime minister to to learn about the region, and some of his connections are 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 very interesting about how the nature of the connections and we haven't talked much about religion but that is that is certainly one of the key links um, I think sometimes uh, Hugh I think you um, did this uh, once or twice I think um, where the maybe it's the maybe the term step up is uh, leads to 
um, misunderstanding about this, that this sense that there's an on and an off to the, to the relationship in the Pacific. And as we've already discussed, there are, uh, there are ongoing, whether we, whatever we call it, there are ongoing relationships. But there's, you know, we've, the, just to look at the development assistance program, apart from anything else, what the, the, the um, patrol boat program has been there for, what is it, 30 years? Yes. Yeah. So yes, yeah. there's a new version of it, yeah. but that doesn't yeah. mean that it's been switched off for, yeah. for 30 years. So yeah. I guess Step Up, it, I think, actually was chosen to give this sense that we were, we were moving and, and we're trying to move a bit further. And I think we're trying to step up in our knowledge as well. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree more about the importance of deep knowledge. And I think if, if we are giving a sense that um, we believe that our knowledge of the Pacific is sufficient, that we've reached that level of knowledge, um, and that because we're comfortable with um, Waigani, that we therefore know how Palau and, and Majura are going to work. I, that's simply not the case. And I think, um, you know, I, I personally wouldn't be there if I didn't think that we could learn, because we need to learn to be to be successful. So f for me, this sort of event and this sort of publication is a, is a critical part of the success of, 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 a, of a step up in the Pacific. Um, I think, I think as, as bureaucrats, as good bureaucrats, as good bureaucrats who are held to account on a regular basis by our own parliament, we have to be able to demonstrate that what we're talking about and what we're spending is actually effective. And I think we should have questions about what does, we haven't discussed this yet, but what does success look like around, around Step Up? And, I, and it's, not, it's not binary. This thing didn't, nobody whipped Step Up out of their pocket and said this is the final product. It, it, it evolved to become Step Up, and I guarantee you that if we have this conversation next year, it will have evolved further still and hopefully in the right direction. But I guess what my, my main feeling is, is simply the, the value of this. We don't want to create a sense that Step Up is going to be easy or that we know all the answers. And the conversations like these, I think, are an important part of us being able to deliver against the objectives that we've got. Thank you, James. Thank you. Can I sit down? Or I have to sit down? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, so, as this panel has demonstrated, there's been a lot of sound and fury about China's rise in the Pacific, a lot of it framing China as a budding colonial power in the Pacific. Meanwhile, old school colonialism never left the Pacific, leaving aside all questions of neo-colonialism. While the focus has been on China's rise, actual colonial powers in the Pacific, I'm thinking particularly of France and Indonesia, have been attempting to entrench themselves as legitimate actors in Oceania, most obviously in Indonesia's attempt to co-opt the Melanesian Spearhead Group. Australia's pretty wholeheartedly embraced France and the charming Mr Macron as a legitimate partner in the Pacific. Um, but if we're talking about issues that are actually of concern to Pacific Islanders, then self-determination in places like West Papua is near the top of the list. So my question is, what's the place of Pacific self-determination in the Pacific step up? Mm. Katerina, would you like to kick that uh -huh. one? <laughs> <laughs> Harry is my honours student, so, <laughs> so <laughs> Harry, <laughs> Harry and I get to talk about this a lot. So I will leave that to others to have the opportunity to answer Harry's awesome question. <laughs> OK, lads. <laughs> well, it's a very good question um, because, you know, I'll, I'll give you what one would call a, real, a realist's answer. And the realist answer is, no, we're not going to touch that. Uh, we're, we're, very, we're very committed to a Pacific step up, I'm sure. But we're not so committed that we're going to risk a relationship with Indonesia. And um, that's, uh, well... I say that it does depend a bit on what happens on the ground, and there's a, the, 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 the place particularly of West Papua and different trajectories there in Australia's relationship with Indonesia is itself a very big deal. But I don't think that's going to be driven by concerns about, what's hap about attitudes in the South Pacific. That's something Australia has been weathering now for decades, and I think we'll continue to do so. Likewise, I mean, it's a, the, the transition, 
uh, attitudes towards France's continued presence in the South Pacific over the last couple of decades has been interesting. Uh, one of the most peculiar things that's happened as Australia has started to register very slowly what China's rise means has been the sudden emergence of a new enthusiasm for the presence of France and Britain as specific powers. Now, frankly, I think this is just complete horseshit. <laughs> uh, if you'll forgive the technical term. But, you know, these countries are not Pacific powers um, at all, one way or the other. Um, and so the idea that France's continued presence in the South Pacific is a strategic asset to Australia, I think is just absurd. Um, but I frankly would think it would be extremely unlikely that Australia would jeopardise a relationship with France which has some other important elements. For example, we're buying submarines from them. Um, <laughs> by touching on an issue which is so neuralgic for France itself. Mm. Um, and, you know, we went through, I mean, it's, it's interesting to reflect on just how bad relations with France got over the testing issue. Um, and uh, I, I think, be, so I, you know, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, I'm just making a, a policy prediction for you. What, whatever else goes on, I think Australia would be very unlikely to sacrifice either of those relationships in order to take on those issues. Say something yeah, I'll, I'll just add quickly that. I mean, your, the preface to your question was fascinating. Um, the question itself was fascinating, but in the preface, you, the difference between the Pacific and, say, Sub-Saharan Africa is Sub-Saharan Africa is genuinely post-colonial, and I don't think the Pacific is, is there yet. These colonial bonds are still there, and they're still extremely strong, um, which is why I guess I'm not entirely convinced with Hugh's central argument that the US is going to leave the Western Pacific, because when you look at Guam, when you look at the Northern Pacific, these are places that um, America was originally giving signals that it was going to leave, but there's no mm. chance of that now. Um, on, the, on the actual question, I think the only one I can see people stepping back and allowing to happen is probably Bougainville. Um, and it's, it's really weird to see us lining up alongside a French colonial power. Um, and, and, you know, Indonesia you can kind of understand because we're you know, we're a bit scared or, you know, we've been scared for years for whatever reason um, and can't seem to find our voice on that. But the, the New Caledonia one is, if you hear someone like Nick McClellan talk on it, um, who, who knows the French side well, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those, it's not, a, it's not a bright spot for Australian diplomacy, but I'm, I'm not sure what choice we have. Yeah. I think we've got time for one more at least. Uh, thanks very much. Um, um, I was just wondering about a part of uh, Australia's step-up policy. Um, a, a senior journalist called it a couple of days ago, um, Australia's Voldemort problem, um, and that's uh, being pushed towards more uh, integration, uh, mainly in economic um, institutions, um, but the sense that uh, if Australia pushes too um, far with uh, integration in economic and security, areas um, that there may be pushback from the Pacific Islands from various fronts. Uh, I was wondering what the panel thought um, on that uh, issue. Did you? I'm not an expert on economic I integration. I know, though, that that it's, it, it's not so great for Pacific Islands, that it's an uneven, unequal kind of um, economic space. And, it would be better if there was a scheme where islanders could figure out how to trade better with each other and Pacific Island goods and services um, uh, were able to circulate better around the region. But usually what comes out of those kinds of free trade agreements is it enables the rim countries, <laughs> the superpowers on the edges to have economic advantage and not small Pacific Island countries. So I'm not a fan of those um, really uneven kinds of agreements. It, it, it doesn't have a lot of economic benefit really for people on the ground. And a lot of pe people in the Pacific have been protesting a whole range of uh, you know, free trade partnerships that have been attempted <coughs> in the Pacific from the, what, T, 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 P? How many T's? <laughs> to the Pacer, PICTA, Pacer Plus, you know, I know some people signed up to Pacer Plus, but um, it's, it's not advantageous to, you know, a lot of Pacific economies. You? 
Yes, look, again, this is not really my, um, my part of the ship, as they say in the Navy, but the thing that strikes me is that one of the things Australia has tended to take for granted for a long time is that we will remain the principal source of future economic opportunities for the countries of the Southwest Pacific, and that has been true for true up to a point, perhaps a bit less than we've thought, but still true up to a point for a fair while, and I think that's very unlikely to be true in future. Um, it's not that China is the only other source of future economic opportunities, but it does seem to me that, and I mean, I don't like to sound like a cracked record on this, but we, 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 Australia, in a sense, the world still hasn't got around to working out what it means to live with a country of 1.4 billion people with per capita GDP nudging up towards middle income. It's a very big economy indeed. We've never seen an economy of that scale. Um, and so it's going to, that, that sheer scale produces economic opportunities as well as economic risks and threats for everyone on a, on a scale which is un, you don't know, Australia has been a very dramatic demonstration of how, part of that. So the proposition, so I, 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 I think that one of the key adjustments we're going to have to make is to recognise that our, our chances of, 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 um, of using these sorts of, um, you know, uh, alphabet soup of, of trade arrangements to try and draw the South Pacific closer to us economically is likely to be defeated by the sheer gravitational pull uh, of an economy of 42 trillion uh, dollars in PPP terms in 2030, to use the Treasury's estimate. No, it was a lovely article by Grandeville, but if it's not used part of the ship, then it's, um, it's not my ship at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, any final thoughts before we call it a day, or have I completely exhausted you? <laughs> I think I can I just, see dinner beckoning yeah, for a few people. I just want to quickly say, you know, I'm, I'm from the School of Culture, History and Language, is, which is not the part of Pacific Studies funded by DFAT. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's, it's a statement about positionality yeah. here. And it's important that policymakers and leaders talk to the whole range of Pacific experts in, in a university like ANU and in other universities. So there's a lot to learn from anthropologists, from linguists, from cultural studies, people, for people who work on the arts. We have something to say about foreign policy. We have something to say about domestic policy. And I think these kinds of conversations are really, really important. So I want to make that plug for the School of Culture, History and Language. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and... I forgot to do a plug for my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> who, who got the best question? And thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Bell. I think we have the best question yes. over here. We do, we do, we do. You get to win Graham oh, yes. Smith's Yeah, go <laughs> Harry. That's <laughs> visual mode, yeah. That's classic. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, thank you for that uh, riveting discussion, really. I think it's clear that, um, you know, Australia as um, is in this weird situation really in the Pacific where it's the biggest and most powerful country. It's a strange situation that Australia occupies and it has given us great advantages um, uh, over the years but it's also presenting difficulties and challenges as well that we're trying to sort out. So thank you so much for, for sort of steering us through that discussion with <coughs> Louise and, um, um, and thank you to the panellists for providing us those insights. Thanks also for James for coming along um, listening and responding. So please, everyone, thank you. Thank the panelists. <laughs>